away. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. This is Alex, and I'm here with Neil. He's going to tell us about planetary imaging tonight. Terry's here, Molly's here, and Eric's here. Uh, we had another training session so that we've got even one more person who can do Streamlabs, and so we should be in better shape in case we have another disaster like we had a couple of weeks ago. So everything is going good. Um, I want to tell you about a few things that will be going on here. Um, and and uh, on the calendar, Neil's today. And next week, it's Independence Day. Happy Fourth of July, everybody. Uh, it's America is taking the weekend off to fire to shoot fireworks and celebrate Independence Day. And uh, for those of you who don't have a Fourth of July, what do you do to keep the third and the fifth from banging together? Never mind. Um, and then the guy who runs Astrobin will be here uh, the week after that, July 11th. And we've got we're starting to have blanks in the schedule today, guys. So, so look at the, we don't like blanks in the schedule. We need your help filling those things in. Be sure to hit the contact button. And from the contact button, you can give us your name and tell us what you'd like to participate in. Um, also, we want to remind you that there's a place over here for you to ask questions of Neil as he's going along. We'll either stop him or we'll wait till the end of the program, depending on what the question's about and stuff like that. And we'll ask him if um, we'll, we'll make sure that everything gets covered one way or the other. So ask your questions over here. Put a big red question mark in there if you can, so that we'll know you've got a special question and not just shooting the breeze and telling us how the weather's going at your observing site. We also want to remind you that uh, bu, 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 Tech Shots Gorgeous Galaxies is about to end. June 30th is coming. Arno has been busy putting together the slideshow for us, and that should be ready. I, I forgot to check with Arno as to just when he's going to be ready with everything, but it should be soon. Um, after we get back, we'll have... We'll have after a, as soon after we get back from the 4th of July, uh, we should have a program with all your gorgeous galaxies. And last I checked, there were like 86 of them or something like that. So it should have a fun, a fun uh, trip. Okay, back to the meeting. Here we are with the meeting and we're ready to go. Neil, are you ready to take over and start sharing your screen? I'm going to stop sharing mine. Uh, yes. Take Alex, over. Alex, yeah. before you start, we got a blank screen over on YouTube, Molly. Oh, With there you room. go. You're back. Okay. Thank you, Alex. Okay. Is Neil coming through? Neil, let's let's make sure. Okay. Yeah, we're we're coming through now. Uh, Everything's fine. Very good. Yep. Sorry about that. That was uh, that was my bad. Okay. I'll share my screen then. Hopefully that works. Can everyone see that okay? Um, yeah, uh, yeah uh, we're, we're seeing so your- uh, Full screen. There we go. Now we're seeing your presentation screen. Okay, very cool. Thank you, Alex, for the introduction. Um, and thank you everyone for the opportunity to present to you on lunar and planetary imaging. Uh, some time ago, uh, an Australian colleague of mine, um, Terry Robertson, got in contact with you, he's on the call and uh, suggested that uh, having seen my images on Astrobin, I uh, should perhaps share some of the techniques I use to produce those images. So thank you, Terry. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about how I do lunar and planetary imaging but, uh, and some of the techniques I've developed along the way myself, but I'm also indebted to a number of people. So um, Anthony Wesley, in particular a fellow Australian who's... Uh, been a great mentor and help to me and probably one of the best uh, planetary images in the world. I've always been inspired, of course, by the images, wonderful images of the likes of Damien Peach. And uh, early on, uh, I learned a lot from Chris Go in from his video, uh, YouTube video on advanced planetary imaging. I'm also indebted to John Rogers from the British Astronomy Association uh, for his introduction to the general uh, planetary imaging community um, and I'm very fortunate to uh, have regular interactions with uh, a bunch of fantastic planetary images like Chris Go, Clyde Foster from South Africa, uh, Andy Casely, Phil Miles, Trevor Barry and a number of others so uh, it's a great privilege to, to be able to do that. 
So here is a montage of, uh, of my solar system images, all except one. I'll leave you to guess which one that is. And, um, yeah, I've been uh, at this game since, um, since I retired in 2015, um, slowly developing my, uh, my technique. So where am I on the blue dot, pale blue dot? Um, so I'm Australian. Uh, you may be able to tell from the accent, but I live in the town of Bathurst. And hopefully you're seeing this uh, from Google Earth where, where I live. Uh, so Bathurst is about 200 kilometres, 150 miles uh, due west of Sydney in the hinterland uh, in the state of New South Wales. And I do my uh, observing and imaging uh, from uh, a location about 30 miles, 40 kilometres from, from Bathurst. Uh, there I'm fortunate to have um, Portal 2 skies. So I do both uh, deep sky and, and planetary. Uh, I'm also fortunate to have an observatory there. And uh, this is a bit of a look at the equipment I use. So I have a C14 Edge HD uh, optical tube, a Paramount MX Plus uh, mount, um, various uh, planetary cameras, ZWO uh, mostly. And um, yeah, as I said, I've been, uh, I've been at it for about five years, um, slowly improving my, uh, my technique. Just a reminder uh, about where we've come from with planetary imaging. So um, these are some images from the 40s through to the 70s, uh, showing um, the best views really of, of, the, uh, of the gas giants uh, from Earth uh, prior to uh, the Voyager uh, space probes uh, fly past in the mid to late 70s. So um, we've, come, uh, we've come a long way obviously since and uh, these are just a couple of my images. So this just goes to show you what a, uh, an amateur with, uh, with moderate, uh, modest equipment can produce uh, these days. Uh, so myself and, and people like me uh, using modern techniques uh, can produce images of much higher quality and resolution than was ever possible even on much larger telescopes uh, in the film era of, era of decades past. So the technique I'm sure you all uh, all know is called uh, lucky imaging, and there has been a revolution in in planetary and lunar imaging uh, as there has been in deep sky, with the advent of um, digital cameras in particular, but also the computer processing software to allow us to uh, produce these images from from the data. So the problem has always been and is today still the atmosphere. So I hope you can see this video that I've uh, I produced of, uh, of Jupiter through a red filter, and you can see the atmosphere, I hope you can see that, washing across the face of the planet. So um, if you stop and take effectively a still, you may be lucky to get a better quality image, or you may be unlucky and get a relatively poor image, depending on what the atmosphere is doing at the point in time. The other thing that always amazes me about looking, when you look at these uh, sort of videos, is how our eyes and brains integrate the data. So I hope you, like me, can you can see the detail of the planet. Our brains are doing that. And um, lucky imaging is, is a technique that uses uh, video cameras, high-speed uh, captures, and computer processing to emulate what our brains can do when looking at, uh, at a video like that. So yeah, it's called lucky imaging, um, but there's not a, a lot of luck about it. it the, the luck is mostly in whether how good the seeing is when you, uh, when you point the telescope at the planet. So, okay, I'm gonna go on and as I mentioned, talk about lunar and planetary imaging capture and processing, how I do that. Uh, I have seen the uh, excellent um, presentations by Agapio Salia and Ray's astrophotography uh, on this process, and I, I use uh, very much the same techniques as they've uh, already spoken about. Uh, I'm not going to cover everything in detail that they've already covered. Um, you can see that from past, um, past presentations. But some areas where they didn't go into so much detail, I will focus uh, on those. So this is a... A, an image from Voyager 1 of, of Jupiter and just shows the tremendous detail that's available to be captured if you have the right uh, equipment and uh, processing techniques to do that. Just a reminder that the general methodology for planetary is the same as uh, deep sky. That is 
capture good data. Good data in terms of seeing is, is probably more important for planetary than it is for deep sky. Um, calibrate images, remove defects and throw away bad, bad data. Now, we don't do as much calibration of images as you do in, in deep sky. Um, we do use darks with low illumination imaging, uh, methane band, for example. Um, but we do throw away a lot of bad data, as you would with deep sky as well. Debayering if one shot color. Alignment, registration and stacking of images. And again, all about signal to noise ratio. LRGB combination if you started with monochrome. And then the same kind of techniques, again, as deep sky, denoising, deconvolving, sharpening, curves and histogram transformation to bring out the, the detail. So what do we need to do uh, well to do planetary imaging well? So we need to have the right equipment, um, prepare for the session, find the planet. Uh, I'll talk a bit about that. It's not as easy as it sounds. Capturing videos, processing videos, and then through to image processing. So I'm going to step through, through these areas. So having the right equipment, I borrowed this slide from Christopher Go um, with his permission, which is uh, nicely um, demonstrates that uh, you know the telescope and, and aperture rule in, in uh, planetary imaging. So where the, uh, the atmosphere is a great leveler and normally would mean that a larger telescope didn't have a particular advantage over a smaller one. In planetary imaging, because of lucky imaging, we can get to the optical resolution of the telescope. And that's where diameter does matter. So as you know, uh, resolution is inversely and linearly proportional to the diameter of the scope. And um, we, we see the evidence every day of the kind of images you can produce with bigger scopes when doing planetary and lunar imaging. Cameras, um, they're almost universally CMOS un uncooled. Dark current noise is not really much of an issue when you've got a 20 millisecond exposure. Um, CMOS has a major advantage that uh, you've got rapid download, download rates for data because we're capturing high speed video effectively. Small pixel size is advantageous for reasons I'll speak about later. And it can be one shot color or, or monochrome. So just uh, one shot color cameras are used for planetary. I th the consensus is that uh, monochrome RGB will uh, produce a better image than one shot color. But as we've seen from Agafios as presentation, he uses one shot color. Many uh, practitioners produce superb images with one shot color as well. Of course, uh, all, all sensors, as, as you all know, are monochrome. Um, with one shot color, of course, you've got the Bayer matrix in front. And the Bayer matrix is uh, a matrix of small filters in blocks of four two green, one red, and one blue. So one of the disadvantages of one-shot color is that 50% uh, of the green photons and 75% of the red and blue ones are lost because they simply fall on the wrong filter. So there's a loss of sensitivity for one-shot color cameras with respect to monochrome. Also the fact that the they're in blocks of four, it's a bit like two by uh, two binning. Um, the red pixels are displaced and so there's also a loss of uh, reduction in image scale um, pixel resolution that needs to be taken into account. Agapia spoke at some uh, length about atmospheric dispersion correct and correction, um, certainly very important with a one-shot color camera and uh, most important when, uh, when the planet is low to the horizon. And as he stated, um, the uh, atmospheric dispersion corrector basically corrects and puts the light back where it uh, should be on the, on the sensor. Just uh, an example, this is um, a uh, picture or a series of pictures of uh, Venus uh, Crescent. You can see the, uh, the image without uh, an ADC at the left. You can correct um, with software to an extent. So the middle image is the left-hand image corrected with uh, RGB align. But as I said, there's a limit to what you can do. But the right-hand image shows you um, the difference when you are using uh, an atmospheric dispersion corrector and the light is going uh, onto the correct spot uh, on the sensor at the outset. Monochrome RGB, um, again, of course, you're all familiar with this stuff. It's um, 
the, the sensor has a has a, a quantum efficiency, uh, mostly designed around the visible uh, spectrum. We do imaging at the um, ultraviolet and infrared ends of the spectrum, where the lower sensitivities can uh, can be an issue. But uh, in general, we use um, red, green, and blue filters, and in general, luminance is is not used. Um, Again, if you're using filters, you need um, there's a range of them. As I mentioned, IR, UV, methane or methane band, uh, eight, eight, nine nanometers is particularly useful for Jupiter and uh, some of the other planets. And of course, we need to present the filters. Um, can be done with manual filter wheel uh, wheels or electronic, which is far preferable, as you all know. Focusing on the planets, again, Agapios did touch on this, it's, uh, th that is very difficult. We don't have the benefit of measuring the full width half max of a star and, and minimising that. Um, we, we have to basically do it by eye looking at the planet. Um, if you're doing, uh, and I, I started off with a manual focuser, if you've got a schmidt cassegrain as I do, then um, the primary mirror is out of the question in terms of focus because as soon as you touch it, the planet disappears. So. Um, inline Crayford style is is a requirement, um, but the manual focuses. You know, it's a bit arduous. You may need a focus change uh, at every filter change, and that uh, that can be quite challenging. Far better, of course, is a motorized focuser, which reproducibly produces the uh, the same focus position. Uh, I start generally with red because it's less affected by the scene. I know the offsets to green and blue, uh, and I can quickly establish focus, and they are then used reproducibly through the run. Um, now, I'm going to talk in much more detail than Agapios did about uh, focal length increases and image scale. It's really important in planetary you get this right, so I'm hoping to give you to understand uh, why that is. Um, this represents my sensor, the 174mm sensor, and the graphic in the middle is the size of Jupiter uh, at, um, at prime focus. They're quite small. So the issue is how many pixels cover the planet? And at prime focus, are there enough? Question. Uh, I use a three times Barlow, and that the image you see there is the size of the planet when I'm using that Barlow. So quite a big difference. Um, this is a, a lunar image, as you as you no doubt guessed, um, the crater Copernicus and Eratosthenes. Um, I did some work looking at uh, resolution on the moon, comparing my images under superb seeing conditions in visible light. Um, this is a colour image against um, the lunar reconnaissance orbiter images, and um, under the best conditions, I can resolve down to about 500 metres craters of of that kind of size. And um, that's equivalent to uh, an image scale of 0.25 arc seconds per pixel. The doors resolution limit for, for my scope is 0.34, so I actually do considerably better than the doors limit. And the doors limit, as you are no doubt aware, is uh, you calculate at 120 over the diameter of the scope in millimetres. But for planetary and lunar imaging, I think we get close to 90 over the diameter. Uh, and it's not difficult to understand that in that I'm sure Dawes was still looking through the atmosphere when he did his determinations and didn't have the benefit of lucky imaging to remove the effects of the atmosphere. And we're also comparing resolution of features on a surface versus separating the two airy rings of, uh, of closely um, uh, stars that are close together. So um, moving further along, image scale, pixel resolution. So the left side is a kind of simulation of what happens when you don't have enough pixels to uh, resolve the, the information that's available on the right side of this image. So I'm just going to take you through the difference uh, between when I had no Barlow um, and Jupiter at 45 arc seconds would only cover about 0.7% of the pixels, 16,400 pixels uh, at, at an image scale of 0.31 uh, arc seconds per pixel. Using the Nyquist three times um, sampling multiplier, that's good for about one arc second resolution on a planet or the moon. 
When I use the three times Barlow, which is actually giving me closer to 3.5 times um, focal length increase, um, because the setback distance is, um, the, the multiplier is actually a function of setback distance. But in that instance, Jupiter covers now 8.5% of the pixels on the sensor. So that's 200,000 pixels. So the difference, 16,000 versus 200,000, I think you'll agree that makes a massive difference to the sampling. And uh, that is then moving to 0.09 arc seconds per pixel. So again, good for the, uh, the optical resolution that uh, I can achieve uh, with my uh, optical tube when the seeing is superb. So from that 90 over D, uh, there's a nice little formula you can use to calculate what focal length increase that you need to ensure that you don't lose resolution or you achieve the optimal resolution of your scope. And it's roughly seven times the pixel size in microns divided by the focal ratio. Uh, so that, I always find that's quite a useful uh, formula to, to quickly work out what, uh, what Barlow you need. Does it make a difference? Um, this uh, early on when I was my C11 when I was uh, imaging Jupiter under superb seeing conditions with the red filter I simply left my paramate off at the time uh, I forgot to put it on and then having realized that I, I, I put it back on and of course I then had two captures one with and one without under very similar seeing conditions and the uh, the resolution difference was uh, was absolutely massive so it shows you how important sampling really is in this game. More recently, um, even with my 2.5 times paramate, I was concerned that I was somewhat under sampling. And based on the advice from uh, Anthony Wesley uh, that I should um, go to a, a, an improved image scale, I went for the three times Barlow. And this graphic shows you the difference in size between the two in terms of the planet on the sensor. Um, and I had the opportunity shortly after that to do a trial run and see what difference there was. So the left uh, slice uh, that you see here is with the previous configuration with a nine meter focal length and an image scale of about 0.14 arc seconds per pixel. And on the rest of the planet is with the three times Barlow, uh, nearly a 13 and a half meter focal length, absolutely massive and an image scale of 0.09 arc seconds per pixel. Now, by, by the time I did the, uh, the latter run, the, pl the um, planet had rotated considerably, as you can see. So the features that you see in the left side um, match up to the features you now see on the right side. So it's a direct comparison of the resolution difference. And I think you'll agree, and you'll agree that that, uh, that difference is absolutely massive. So session planning um, might seem obvious, but uh, most of us, I guess, use um, some kind of planetarium program like Stellarium or the SkyX to locate the planet to know when it's going to be at the right altitude. Here we see, for example, that Jupiter's at 75 degrees altitude for me. So, um, you know, we in, we in the Southern Hemisphere have been very fortunate in recent years to have the planets at very high altitudes like that. And I certainly don't envy uh, what you guys in the Northern Hemisphere have had to face with the planets down at 15 to 30 degrees. Uh, makes, uh, makes life very difficult. However, your turn will come. I also use the Windjupos ephemerids uh, extensively um, to see what features I'm going to be uh, imaging, whether the position of the great red spot, um, moon or shadow transits, occultations, uh, or on Mars, for example, what... Uh, what albedo features um, would be visible when I'm imaging. So I was pleased to see that Ray's astrophotography talked about um, the difficulty of finding the planet. You can imagine at 13 and a half meters focal length how small the field of view is. And no matter how good your pointing um, model and accuracy is, um, you will often and probably usually uh, end up um, slewing to the planet and not having it on your uh, on, on your monitor. Um, so I still use my finder scope um, and uh, occasionally if you just can't find it for whatever reason it may be worth removing the Barlow or even defocusing the planet to find it. 
Um, again, Agapios uh, spoke at length about collimation. Um, he, uh, I have met a guide uh, on my computer, but I'd never really used it. But based on his uh, his strong recommendation, I'm going to move to that. So, but collimation is massively important in planetary imaging. The other important area is thermal equilibrium, um, ensuring that your scope is at temperature. I think this is probably the biggest uh, issue for planetary images and getting a decent quality image. Um, you know, my telescope would need to be in the environment for at least two hours to not have significant issues with thermal thermals coming off the uh, off the mirror. I'm fortunate to have the telescope in uh, in an observatory, so it's. Um, it's at temperature, but if you're bringing it from outside of the house, you really need to allow uh, that time. Like uh, in deep sky, dust is a huge issue for, for planetary. As you can see here, this is a, one of my images after our dust storms and fires of uh, 2019. Uh, this was kind of the impact uh, for me uh, with, with Jupiter. So capturing the video uh, now, there are various uh, software available for this. Uh, like Agapios, I use Fire Capture. SharpCap is another alternative. Um, he, one area I differ a little bit from Agapios is he runs the highest frame rate possible. Um, I used to do that, uh, but I had some advice from Anthony Wesley that uh, you should only run a frame rate that's consistent with freezing the scene and um, not go faster than that or not have shorter exposures than that because you want as many photons per frame as possible from a signal to noise ratio perspective. So uh, he was recommending around 50 frames a second, 20 milliseconds. Uh, but I did a series of trials uh, just uh, looking at um, under the same conditions uh, what each frame rate would give me. And I hope you can see this image, but um, it was very clear to me that the 75 frames per second was giving was the optimum and I was getting far better definition than at lower or higher speeds. So to this day, uh, I set my exposure time to 30 milliseconds and I adjust the gain until I get an 80% histogram. The other area um, which is important is video time. Um, the planets rotate really quickly. This is two hours of rotation on Jupiter. So there's a maximum time that you can video. Um, this, there's an animation here in front of me. I hope you can see that. Um, this is 10 minutes worth of video uh, through an 850 nanometer IR filter. One derotated and integrated and one not. And you can see how much of a blurring of the features occurs if uh, uh, due to the rotation of the planet. So. There's a, there's a maximum. Now I design it so that the a feature in my first frame will move no more than 50% of the op optical resolution by the last frame and that sets the maximum limits or thereabouts. So for my C14, uh, here are the limits, four minutes for Mars, 0.8 minutes for Jupiter. I do use one minute. Um, the stacking program, Auto Stacker, does a modicum of derotation because it aligns features and, and you can get away with that. And Christophe Pellier has done a study that, uh, that shows that very clearly. Saturn, one and a half minutes, Uranus, 14, and Neptune, 22. Um, again, Agapios went through, through fire capture in some detail. Uh, like him, I use the auto guiding and auto align features and it's very convenient to you also use the auto run feature to sequence the capture. So where he was doing a series of color captures, uh, I'm doing it swapping filters, red, green, blue, IR, red, green, blue, IR uh, with a 60 second limit. And I typically would aim for Jupiter to do, to do that um, five, seven, nine times. I, I use an odd number for reasons I'll explain in a minute. So uh, once we've got our videos, we need to, um, to process them. And um, I use also, uh, as Agapios uh, does, Auto Stack Art. Uh, he went through some detail on that that I'm not going to repeat. The one thing I will talk about, though, is the alignment boxes. Um, so Auto Stack Art has the feature that it can realign features that have moved due to atmospheric turbulence uh, within the box. 
Uh, so you get a better stack as a result of that. Now, if those alignment boxes are too big, then you're going to have features within that box that are moving independently and you won't get as good a result. But also if they're too small, as it was described to me, it's like doing a jigsaw puzzle with really tiny pieces. Uh, the, so I try to aim for between 15 and 25 uh, alignment boxes, uh, and that seems to work very well. Uh, on to sharpening. Uh, now, Ray's astrophotography did all of his sharpening, as he mentioned, in uh, Pix and Sight with uh, unsharp masking. Like Agapios, I use, and many others use, Registack and, and a powerful wavelet sharpening tool. Um, there's many different configurations you can use for the sharpening, and I'll just show you one I use here. I always thought that the, um, the stacked image was rather disappointing, quite blurry, um, but it's almost like magic uh, here when you apply the wavelets uh, to, to sharpen the, um, the stacked image. I use linked wavelets quite a bit. I know others like Anthony Wesley don't like to do the denoising during this step. And he uses default linear uh, step zero quite a bit, um, basically adjusting the higher level filters two, three, and four, uh, believing that the um, small filter level uh, introduces noise. So there's a number of different ways you can achieve the sharpening result. And as Agapio said, it's important um, to not just use one generic set of settings. It can be different from run to run. The other big bugbear and biggest mistake I think that planetary images make is over sharpening, including myself. Uh, in fact, this is an example where I'd over sharpened the right hand images and I actually went back and reprocessed. Um, if you look at the complex wake of Jupiter in a, a Juno image or a Hubble image, the transitions of the boundaries are very subtle, but it's just so easy to keep going with those sliders to make them more and more defined, um, but it becomes unnatural. The key question you have to ask yourself is, does, does this look like a, a, a photograph or does it look like a cartoon? And when you think you got the sharpening just right, you just went too far, so back it off a bit. That would be my advice. I'm also going to talk about uh, a very powerful piece of software called WinDupos now, um, maybe covering it in a bit more detail again than Agapios did. Um, so because of the rotation of the planets, um, you would think we're limited to one, perhaps one RGB capture. However, this powerful software can derotate multiple captures. And that means that um, we can get a higher signal to noise ratio fundamentally. So um, the, uh, when we bring images uh, from auto stack art into um, WinDupos uh, and Registax, um, it's, uh, it's actually quite important. And again, as Agapios talked about, to tick the uh, the uh, WinDupos compliant um, file naming in Fire Capture, because uh, WinDupos needs to know some things. It needs to know the universal time that the capture was taken, and with uh, with that file name from Fire Capture, um, it, it reads that automatically. Otherwise, you have to enter the time manually, which is extremely time consuming and arduous. The other thing that WinDupos needs to do, it makes a cylindrical projection from the multiple images and derotates them to the midpoint so that the features align and can be integrated. Um, to do that, it needs to know how big is the planet and is it what is its uh, orientation. So there's a measurement process required and uh, there's a measurement graphic that can be increased in size or shrunk or um, increased around the planet and then you can change the horizontal orientation. Now, uh, what I always do is I take a wide field capture at the beginning of uh, a run to include the moons, preferably on both sides of the planet. Um, and then I crop in around the planet with the region of interest to take the remaining captures. Why do I do that? Because in, uh, in the measurement process, um, the moons uh, allow you to very accurately do the measurement um, correctly. So if, uh, if the little um, graphic is over the moon um, or the moons, 
then you know the horizontal orientation and the size are correct. Now with uh, wind, with uh, Jupiter in Wind Jupos, if you press F11, it gives you a measurement to a first approximation, as I did here. But you can see that the moon graphic is slightly displaced, so it is slightly in error. Um, and it is uh, very much worthwhile um, using the uh, the moons, as I mentioned, to get a more accurate uh, assessment. Um, so you then go through with the measurement from image uh, to image. Uh, and once you've got it, uh, because you've cropped in uh, with a region of interest, when you come to your first capture, it will be displaced from the calibration image at the beginning. But now you just need to move the measurement graphic over the planet to fix that. And it's right from then on. Uh, but you do know that the orientation and size are correct and you just have to get the positioning over the planet right from that point. One very interesting observation is after you've been through all your reds and you move to green, the planet jumps. Uh, and that is actually the manifestation of atmospheric dispersion, which is so the green light is going onto the sensor in a different position. Um, we then move the measurement graphic back over the planet, and that is how, with monochrome RGB, we compensate for atmospheric dispersion and correct for it. And then when you go on to blue, it, it jumps uh, again. Um, so that's quite an important um, reason why uh, ADCs are not, uh, not as advantageous with monochrome RGB as they are with one-shot colour. Uh, I did a little study looking at uh, how important was it to get the alignment right. I don't know if you can see this very well, but it, there is a demonstrable difference uh, using the moon alignment method to the quality of the final image. So we've got a bunch of red uh, captures, a bunch of green, a bunch of blue. Uh, and now we want to derotate and integrate all the reds, then all the greens, then all the blues. So here I have all the reds lined up. And this is the result. So this is a, um, a red uh, consolidated uh, or integrated image from a bunch of captures. So when Dupost does a very nice job with that. Once we've got all our reds, all our greens and all our blues, they need to be derotated and integrated because, again, they are displaced uh, in time. So if you look at the times here, 1954, 1955 and 1956 uh, for the uh, red, green, blue, um, and when Dupos has the capability of compensating and correcting for that by derotation. So we end up with this uh, very nice uh, image, which is the final result uh, from when Dupos. Now that we've integrated a whole bunch of extra data, uh, we can do another start sharpening step. So it goes back into, I take it back into Registax. And uh, Registax is quite useful at this point. You can see the image is a little bit uh, blurry. Uh, when I go into Registax, um, the first thing I do is an RGB align. So Registax, there may be some slight errors in your alignment of red, green and blue. Registax um, looks at the red, green and blue components of the image, finds the center point, um, and if they are somewhat displaced, moves the red and the blue to the green and corrects for any misalignment, so that's quite useful. I also do an RGB balance, so you see the result of the colour change there. So you get a more natural, realistic colour with RGB balance and then a small amount of wavelet sharpening. Um, as Agapios pointed out in his uh, presentation, if you use the same settings as previously, um, you will, uh, you'll end up way over sharpened. So it's very subtle. Notice also that there are some artifacts on the limb. There's um, a bit of um, uh, the rind effect you can see there. Um, so the more captures you make with, with wind Dupos and the more you integrate, the, the worse the, the limb and terminator get affected. So what I typically do is I also integrate the central run so if I make seven, I take the central run, which has the same timestamp as the integration of seven, seven. And then in Photoshop, I integrate the limb of the single RGB run with, with the seven, or the central proportion of the, of the seven. Uh, also in Photoshop, uh, I move the black point to the edge of the histogram. So such the dynamic range 
the histogram spans the entire dynamic range. And I make a small curve, uh, negative gamma um, correction just to, to improve contrast. So you'll see the difference there as I step back to before and after Photoshop. So it really does lift uh, the image considerably. Now, like uh, Ray's astrophotography, I use PixInsight because I do deep sky. Neil, could you wait? Could you wait one second? I think we're having a little issue over on on YouTube, Molly. Sure. No, I, I fixed it. I last week I was able to change screens, and the video was still going. But this week uh, it wants me to stay on the same screen. So. Carry on. <laughs> okay, Neil, okay. As, as long as we have a little interruption, a couple of questions have come up. Yeah. Uh, it'll probably take you back in the presentation a little bit. Sure. Uh, but one is, what's your opinion of using eyepiece projection adapter method uh, with eyepiece and Barlow in the light path? I, I think um, you can get an image. It will just be, in my experience, is vastly inferior quality to uh, using a focal length increaser like a Barlow. Um, I'm not sure of the reasons, but I gave that away very quickly. Okay. Uh, second question. Is there a minimum altitude to do planetary, uh, for example, at the meridian? Um, you would prefer not to be much below 35 degrees. Um, you can image b uh, below that, and I do see some good images coming out of um, Europe and North America, um, Russia, etc. Uh, at lower altitudes like 25 degrees. But under those circumstances, the seeing, it, it has to be one of those super special nights where the seeing is absolutely fantastic. So you might only have a handful of occasions a year where you could get a really good image below about 25 degrees. Uh, so another question, you used auto stacker, and I noticed that your quality curve was for a planetary was a whole lot different than, say, a surface. Yeah. Um, that, that's just a function. The, the, the quality curve is a function of, of the data that was received So, the, and, and the seeing on the particular occasion. So if you've got um, you know, really steady seeing conditions, you'll just get more good frames. Uh, if the seeing is variable, you'll get more bad frames. So the shape of the curve is a function of primarily of what the seeing was on the particular capture occasion. And what percentage of the capture frames do you integrate generally? So good question. Um, it's quite variable. Under really excellent seeing conditions, I have taken up to 75%. Um, but I'm more normally below 50% and can, can be down as low as 15%. What I've, I did a, a little bit of work, um, generally as a rule of thumb, once the curve falls below that 50% mark on the quality graph, that's a pretty good time to, or a pretty good place to, uh, to stop uh, accepting the frames. Um, I did some trials which showed that was pretty, a pretty good correlation when you actually did a sensitivity analysis. And is that the same for a lunar, for a surface as it is for planetary? Yes. Yeah. Okay, those are all the questions I have right now. Super questions, thank you. There's one more uh, that just popped up on, on YouTube about, um, uh, it says, uh, I see you have a focal length that goes beyond the rule of thumb of having a focal ratio equal to five times the pixel size. How important is this to get a good sample of the image? Well, like I said, I think there's some rules of thumb. I, I don't agree with that five times because it's not consistent with my experience. So uh, I would go um, with, uh, and, and my, my experience, and I think that of other planetary images, is that um, the focal length you need is consistent with that equation. I gave you seven times the pixel size divided by the focal ratio. We all have our different rules of thumb, though, but um, that, that, that's certainly consistent with my experience for the reasons I hope uh, I brought to light here. And actually, as we're, we're speaking right now, another question has come in. I've noticed that when using my 2X PowerMate shooting Mars at last opposition on uh, the 8-inch Edge HD, I got far lower quality images. Does this mean that my seeing just doesn't support the focal length? 
uh, lower quality images. Um, it's yeah, it could be that. So um, the the benefit of the higher, uh, the longer focal length only comes to the fore when the seeing is really good. Uh, there's no benefit when the seeing is 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 no good, and. Um, you know, like they say, you can't make a silk purse out of a sound's ear. If the seeing is four arc seconds, you're not going to get a decent um, planetary image. If your seeing is never better than three arc seconds, then um, don't don't bother with um, a, a long focal length because you're, ne you're never going to uh, realise the benefits. So that could well be the case that it's consistent with uh, not having uh, seeing uh, that allows you to enjoy the full benefits of uh, lucky imaging. Okay, so I should continue. Um, yeah, as I said, I, I find that TGV denoise uh, works very, very well. What I do in Pix Inside is I split it back into its red, green, and blue components, and I denoise them separately. Blue is always worse than green; is always worse than than, than red. And so, but I can fine tune the denoising uh, appropriate to the level of noise in each color channel, which means I don't. Um, uh, I, I minimise the, the loss of sharpness um, by doing that and then I put the planet back together again and I use some unsharp masking to restore any lost sharpening, uh, sharpness and then some. And I think the result comes out uh, very well. Um, single run versus multiple runs derotated, generally you get a better result uh, with WinDupos with one caveat. Um, Anthony Wesley would say to me, that's okay, but if the seeing is absolutely superb, you can end up with a better result from a single RGB capture. And the reason is um, you, you will have a high uh, number of frames that you're stacking, you've got plenty of photons, and there is always some error introduced when you do derotation because of that alignment process. So. Um, just bear in mind that uh, generally WinDupos derotation gives a better result, but under really superb conditions, you may still find a single RGB capture gives you a better result. Techniques for Saturn. Um, Saturn and Agapios touch on this is a really difficult planet. I, I actually do 15 1.5 minute uh, captures per color channel RGB. Uh, and that's an hour of capture to get good enough data to get the signal to noise ratio right. Um, I also differentially sharpen. The, the rings do not bear the sharpening that the planet does. So I, sh I sharpen just a very small amount for the rings. They, they love the sharpening and they you start getting artifacts very quickly. And then I, I go harder for the, for the planet to bring out the features you can hopefully see here. And then I put the two together in, in Photoshop. So a differential sharpening. I also use um, the curves function in PixInsight to just, uh, just bring out the crepe ring, the inner C ring, um, which can be quite uh, ill-defined. Um, moving on to the outer planets, um, again, they have their challenges. The color is, is uh, you, you won't see any detail with uh, RGB. All the detail comes from uh, infrared. Um, but you can see the brighter pole of Uranus and you can see some subtle features on, on, on Neptune as well. Uh, touching on false color imaging, so we do some of this as well. With uh, I do this with Venus. Um, so Venus is really bland in, uh, in the visible spectrum generally, um, but at the blue-violet, ultraviolet end of the spectrum, it does show uh, features. So one form of false colour imaging, it also shows features in, in infrared, is uh, you can take, make the infrared red, ultraviolet, blue, and then a 50-50 blend green. That's one form of false colour imaging. What I have done here is to take the blue, violet, and ultraviolet captures and each of them, there's no reason why they should be uh, um, any different in terms of subtlety of, uh, of features versus red, green, or blue. Uh, and I tell the software that blue is red, violet is green, and ultraviolet is blue. And I spectrum shift it into the visible spectrum so we can see a nice uh, false color composite image there on the, on the left, which I think, I hope you agree, beautifully shows the, the features that uh, that can be visible on the Venusian uh, atmosphere. 
Uh, animation, so because we take stills, we can put those together and animate them. And uh, this is actually a capture I made in 2018 uh, on Mars. I hope you can see this, but um, from a series of captures, I was able to uh, image dust clouds moving uh, on the surface of the planet. And um, as far as I know, I'm, I'm, I'm the only one fortunate enough to actually have picked that um, movement up, but I animated that uh, so that you can see that the the features, the, the dark features there being the volcanoes are relatively stationary and the um, the clouds are moving and that's uh, cloud dust cloud movement over about two and a half hours. Uh, finally, I want to go on to talk about a really difficult problem in planetary imaging, which is this edge diffraction effect called, with Mars, it's known as the Mars edge rind effect. So. Uh, Martin Lewis uh, has written an absolutely excellent article on this, uh, and I've put the website address for that. Uh, definitely a wonderful reference, but it's a huge problem uh, where you end up with this kind of diffraction ring or this ring inside the, the limb of the planet. The harder the cutoff from light to dark, the sharper that is, and the worse it is. And um, from, from what I understand, and also what Martin has elucidated, uh, it is actually a, a real diffraction effect because it gets worse um, uh, with, with wavelength. So uh, diffraction rings, the size of a diffraction ring is proportional to the wavelength and inversely proportional to the diameter of the telescope. So um, longer wavelengths like infrared suffer much worse uh, than shorter wavelengths and red is worse than green, is worse than blue in particular. Uh, this is an image of Mars where you can you can see this is again from 2018. Uh, you can see the green and blue images don't really suffer much from this uh, diffraction edge effect, but the red image does, and that does come through in the final image. Um, near opposition, and this is uh, two images I took from the 2020 opposition. Uh, when you integrate multiple runs in WinDupos, you can actually... Um, reduce the impact of, of that rind, edge rind effect. And the other thing you can do is, is uh, differentially sharpen again, as I did with Saturn. So take the edge from a less sharpened image and combine it with the more sharpened image of the rest of the planet uh, on the basis that unfortunately the sharpening, wavelet sharpening exacerbates uh, the, the effect. Um, I've actually got some quite nice images of Jupiter's moons. Uh, what I find interesting enough is if the moon is in front of the planet, I get far, far more detail than if it's against the blacker space. And the reason is, again, this same diffraction effect. You end up with a, um, you end up with a ring inside the, the moon that destroys a lot of the detail available. So um, that means that we, we can get quite good images of the anti-Jovian side or anti-Jovian side of Jupiter but difficult to get the pro-Jovian side. And again, a reminder, the moons are tidally locked to the planet. Uh, just again, this is also a huge issue in uh, lunar imaging. This is an image I took uh, relatively recently, very good seeing um, colour image of, of Copernicus, very high resolution. And, and a friend of mine uh, on uh, Astrobin um, sent me his images. He had exactly the same um exactly the same aspect. Now compare the two images and you'll see that there are a huge number of artefacts in his image. So um, my telescope's 14 inch, 35 centimetres, his is um, 7 inch. So uh, again, for the reasons I mentioned before, the bigger the diameter, the less this effect, the smaller the diameter, the worse it is. I imaged in colour, he imaged in infrared. So this rind effect, if you want to call it that, or edge diffraction effect was much, much worse. When that happens, there's a limit to how far you can sharpen. And he went then, I've just, uh, hopefully you've seen the difference here, he backed the sharpening right off and he got a much, much better image as a result. So please, if you're doing lunar, be aware of that effect and, and avoid over sharpening. Um, here I'm looking at that in, in much better detail. So. The top left image is my image with the C14, and you can see a number of tests that he did at different sharpening levels with this uh, edge diffraction effect, which is quite severe. 
Finally, I just want to go on to talk about Detect. So I would encourage anyone who's doing planetary imaging to use this fabulous piece of software, um, which is supported by Marc Delcroix. And uh, it allows us to automatically uh, check our video captures for impacts. Uh, we, I, I don't know about you guys, but I don't spend uh, all my time looking at the screen during captures. So it's very easy to miss, uh, miss an impact. And uh, just to show you how effective the software is, um, Ethan Chapel in Texas um, in 2019 used this software to pick up an impact that he himself had not observed. Um, and a, a fantastic accolade to him for doing that and for the for Mark and, and the software that allows us uh, to do that. So um, that's, that's all I had at this stage, uh, unless anyone's got any, uh, any other questions uh, regarding the presentation. That's um, super cool. I've never heard of that software. Oh, man, i got to check that out now, the detect uh, software. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely fantastic, and um, there have been a small number of um, impacts detected through time, mostly by people being lucky enough to see them. And um, and Mark and the team have uh, they've they've won some awards for the uh, for that software in terms of uh, what it uh, what it can do for us. So um, it's very easy. You just tell it this is the folder where all the films are, and it goes away and does it. And then it comes back to you with a whole series of images just to check is it, is this a possible impact? So um, much much easier cool. than um, looking at every uh, every every video capture. Um, yeah. Does that, does that work on uh, uh, on the moon as well? Um, I don't think so. Uh, he only ever talks about uh, Jupiter and Saturn, so that's actually a very, very good question. Um, generally, because we're not doing videos looking at the full moon, um, you know, there's, uh, the, perhaps the opportunity for picking up those sort of captures is, or those impacts is, is not there, I don't know. But that's a very good question. Okay. I do have one question, more of a curiosity. Why, why uh, is luminance not used with the RGB? It just doesn't, uh, it doesn't bring any advantage. All of the yeah. detail is, is, is visible and available there from red, green, and blue. Um, okay. And, um, yeah, just experience says, and I have tried this as well, you just don't get a better image. Um, well, I think, the reason, I think the reason for that is um, when you're at these really long focal lengths, the tiny differences between the red, green, and blue channels are more apparent. And um, that luminance channel is getting all those wavelengths and they're all being distorted by the atmosphere. Um, and instead of focusing to be able to correct for each one, you've got all of them onto one image. And uh, I've always done better using an IR image as a luminance channel or just not using one at all than, than having a luminance channel. I have, reason. I have used IR uh, on the moon uh, as a luminance channel with RGB. Yeah, but I think you're right. Also, uh, if you are using luminance, then um, at atmospheric dispersion is an issue. The light is going onto the sensor at different places, so yeah. you would you would need also need an ADC if you were doing that. Yeah, Neil, could you uh, talk a little bit more about focusing? Uh, I don't do planetary, but I do solar and. Focusing drives you crazy. Yes. And that you're, you're looking for those moments when it's in focus. If you're in your critical focus zone, uh, the only difference is to get those moments of seeing. Is there any other method that you know of that can help that along? Um, well, one of the features I think Agapios mentioned was uh, using auto align on fire capture, which stills the planet and I guess would still the lunar features as well, uh, the solar features. So having it still, not moving, makes it much easier to determine whether it's in focus. But basically what I do is I go backwards and forwards through the, through the focal position and usually I can find where it's definitely out of focus both ends and come somewhere in the middle and go, yes, that looks right. But to your point, as the turbulence washes over the planet, it, it can be going in and out of focus due to the turbulence. So it is extremely difficult to get right. I find it much easier in, uh, with experience now in, in RGB, but I still struggle on some of the um, methane or methane band uh, filters. Um, you often have to go to the moons to actually try and 
um, find a position where they have their smallest uh, size and, and that's a, a good approximation to the focus for the planet. So are you usually imaging when the object, the planet is at its maximum or when the seeing is best under your conditions? And is there a difference? Well, uh, when the planet is at its zenith, um, you're looking through the least amount of atmosphere. So, you know, under any seeing conditions, it's you're going to get a, a better result. The more atmosphere you're looking through, then the more opportunity the atmosphere has to interfere with what you're trying to do. So I do sometimes image at lower altitudes if there's a particular event happening. I'm trying to capture the GRS, great red spot, there's something going on there. Um, or there's a, a transit that I want to, to capture. But generally, around opposition, I'll be waiting till you know, between 11 and 1 a.m. Uh, to be getting the best possible conditions. There's a question in the chat. What is the, from Linda, what is the smallest instrument you think is practical for doing planetary imaging? Um, it's, uh, it's a difficult question. It's... Uh, uh, you definitely need bigger aperture with planetary than, than of course, in, in many small uh, apo refractors can produce wonderful wide field images in deep sky of, of the highest quality. Um, I probably wouldn't be going much below six inches, preferably at least eight inches to get a decent quality image. And like I said, everything works for you as you go, um, with the possible exception, some people believe that seeing impacts are worse the bigger the diameter, but as I mentioned, yeah, I was going to ask you about that as well, because I've always gotten better images on my 8-inch than my on my 11-inch McCassegrain. And, you know, I mean, in theory, the larger apertures are capturing a wider atmosphere column that has a higher chance of having some bad, you know, some, some turbulence in it. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? I think that is a factor. Um, but again, you hope to be at such conditions that... Um, the lucky imaging process is still um, getting you to the optical resolution of your telescope. The other interesting thing is I th it's it's pretty clear to me that there's a kind of a, I don't know whether it's one or one and a half second advantage you get using lucky imaging. Um, and red is better than green, it's better than blue in terms of the seeing. So sometimes you can find the red channel has come into the optical resolution of the telescope, but the blue channel, you haven't had enough advantage to get you to the optical resolution. Um, so, uh, I've certainly found with lunar imaging, uh, there are times when the seeing is not good that infrared gives you a better result because it's less affected by the seeing. Yeah. But if the seeing is really good, you get a much better resolution due to the shorter wavelength of green and possibly even blue under the absolute best of conditions. So, hmm. I encourage people to do more imaging of the moon. Uh, in the visible spectrum. You know, so wait for really good seeing and you'll get better resolution and less of the, these diffraction artifacts uh, with green or blue than you would get with, uh, with red or infrared. Now, do you ever uh, crop down your, your sensor in order to just frame the planet rather than use all the pixels? And yeah, if you do, well, does, it make a, does that make a difference in your captures? Yeah, huge. I do that all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, Agapio spoke of the uh, region of interest um, feature in fire capture. So you just draw a box around the planet and you only capture those pixels. So all of those black pixels um, outside are not captured. So you get much smaller files and, and much higher frame rates. You can find um, you reach a point as you go up in region of interest size where there's now so much data to be downloaded that the frame rate is uh, is, is being limited. So you yeah. want, I've, uh, I try and crop in as close around the planet as possible to get the smallest files. Because again, as Agapios was mentioning, you can get hundreds of gigabytes worth of, uh, worth of data. The smaller you make those captures, the, the less data. Uh, and you don't need the blackest space, it tells you absolutely nothing. Now, do you have any issue with Newton rings for planetary? Um, remind me what they are, I'll tell you. Newton rings, oh, we've had a lot of discussion of how they're formed, but basically you have these concentric rings which 
seem to be produced by the difference in refraction of the front and the back of the glass plate that covers the sensor, although I think that's open for a discussion. So you get these series of concentric large rings which go across your image. Um, I've never I, I've, seen it for solar. I don't know if it's... Uh, it's happened it, all it the time in on, solar. Yeah. So um, I'd recommend, if you have a look at uh, Martin Lewis's article that I referred you to, uh, he talks about various sorts of artifacts, including kind of onion rings and, and stuff like that. Right. He might, I, he might have called it onion rings. He called it yeah, onion it, rings. It, it, it's, um, I, I personally haven't experienced that since I did experience that when I was originally imaging with a DSLR. But since I've been doing planetary with planetary cameras, I've, I've not had that issue. Um, I think um, for, the, for the Newton rings being um, much more present for solar imaging than others, I think that also has to do with the fact that you're taking an extremely narrow swath of wavelength. And that can start to do funny things with uh, with the optics of the telescope. Um, yeah. For doing wideband imaging for the moon and planets, I think that doesn't really show up. Right. I've never seen it for uh, lunar. Yeah. But the solution for solar is to tilt your camera yeah. one or which two is degrees. Wild. <laughs> which, which is, I mean, it, it still keeps you in the critical focus zone but it seems to handle those Newton rings, but not an issue with planetary, right? No, not that okay. I'm aware. Um, we have two or three other questions coming in from the chat group, and I encourage everybody to, to get their questions in here because Neil is here and obviously very gracious in answering them. Um, Kajuman wants to know, have you ever tried other filters? He mentions that he's tried uh, to test on Jupiter with an O3 filter. Have you have any success with other filters? Um, I personally ha have not used any of the kind of um, what we term deep sky narrowband filters. I know, I know some people use hydrogen alpha filters to get a very narrow uh, infrared capture on a, on a bright object, but uh, no, I have not used uh, O3. As I mentioned, I have used some... Uh, filters like uh, violet, et cetera. But no, we tend to pretty much stick to RGB and then uh, using a range of infrared band passes. So I've got, um, you know, 642 nanometer um, band pass, 850 nanometer up to um, methane band. So, and then ultraviolet at the other end of the spectrum. Uh, how wide are those filters? Um, well, the, the band pass ones are sort of start at the, the, that wavelength and then, you know, if it's IR 650, you get everything above 650. Um, the methane band, as I understand it, is 889 and the bandwidth is about 20 nanometers, something like that. But, yeah, it's an interesting question. I've never really tried. Uh, okay. Personally, I don't have O3 in a configuration I can use with planetary because okay. I've got a planetary camera that's got 50 millimeter square um, filters and that and that camera itself is not suitable to planetary imaging okay um have you tried a cutter telescope i don't i'm not familiar with that or schiff spiegler no no I've, I, my experience is purely with uh, schmidt cassegrains okay and then david watkins asks do you have any tips for imaging mercury uh did yeah, um, that's a very good question. Mercury is a difficult planet because being an inner planet and so close to the sun, it's always very close to the horizon. That means you're always imaging at low altitude. So I would be trying to image it around its maximum elongation, which is a, a nice combination of uh, phase and apparent diameter, so around you know 50% full. Um, when it's on the other side of the sun where it's fuller, it's very small, and then you get the mm -hmm. crescent. Uh, uh, as you get closer, um, you, you really uh, morning is generally better than evening because in the evening, um, except for maybe fifteen minutes before sunset, where there's a kind of a, an inversion shift and it stills for a very short time. But uh, often you're getting thermals from the heat of the day off the land that make the seeing uh, you know a huge problem. I have had much more success in the morning with with Mercury. And you just really need to make um, 
make the captures on, on those uh, occasions where the seeing is really excellent. I've had one capture in colour uh, where the seeing was good enough to get a colour image of, um, of uh, Mercury. Mercury also suffers really badly, like Mars, from this uh, rind effect, the edge effect. So there can be some challenges in, in, in processing um, Mercury. Okay, um, you know I'm gonna I'm gonna share the screen for a minute, uh, Eric. If and Molly, if you if you could review the um, chat area, make sure that we've got everybody's question. And if there's anybody out there with more questions, be sure to get them in. I'm just gonna take a a minute interlude to present my screen here because I want to remind you um, that. Um, there we go. They remind you that uh, there have been other programs. Uh, Neil would graciously mention them, and he says he's reviewed them so that he wouldn't duplicate things. But uh, if you want to duplicate what he's done, do the work that he did, uh, you go to the program database here, spreadsheet data program database. And when you do that, you can come over here and under the other activities here, you can go to find and type in the word planetary or planets or something like that. And uh, we've had 11 mentions of planetary programs. Uh, and there was one on the 14th of December. And you can go to look up. Uh, I remember Agapio Salia did a great couple of shows on this a while back. Um, and we've been doing planetary shows for quite some time. We don't have 10 shows in there. There's just it's a big spreadsheet and you're searching the spreadsheet and there's there's 11 mentions of the word planetary at some point or another. So I just wanted to take that opportunity to remind you all of that. And, um, you know, you just go over there and you find it and you can you have access to uh, all of the um, all of the programs. Now, I've stopped sharing, haven't I? Yeah. And we're back to uh, Terry and Molly and um, and um, Eric. How are we doing on questions? I have also, I have also uh, organized things into playlists on YouTube, okay. more or less. Um, so that's another place. Uh, it's not definitely not as refined as the spreadsheet, but if you're kind of looking for overall, like I have a um, category for image processing, one for software, one for hardware, stuff like that. Um, is another. Uh, kind of way of yeah. looking at those videos. And, and just, yeah. just uh, I, I can get there pretty quick. I'm, I was just there. So let me, I'll let me show them that. I should cool. have mentioned that also. Um, we, again, go back to the, um, uh, uh, I don't know where we go. We go someplace very important. There we go. Same place, program database section. If you come down to this link right here and you hit that link and up pops the various uh, uh, solar system imaging is the one that Molly was referring to. So when you go there, you can find all sorts of solar system imaging and playlists and stuff like that. Okay, so that's a couple of couple of assets that we have organized through the years that you guys may want to benefit from. But let's not take away from uh, Neil. He's here to answer your questions. Eric, do we have any questions that we haven't covered yet? Uh, there was one question, but I answered it over there. It was uh, the percentage of the frames used for a stack. Can I ask uh, a question? Uh, he also was the uh, he was asking. JC was asking about um, nice the sharing. number of stacking yeah. points. So the I think he's referring to an auto stacker. How you choose the sample points? Um, is there? Yeah. A, I, I remember if you talked about whether there's kind of a guideline for the size and and number of those. Yeah, so that's a good, very good question. Um, I actually, as I mentioned, I just changed the sizing of the boxes to end up with, I target about 20, 15 to 25. Um, it actually, the, you can uh, automatically um, position those boxes. The little mouse over says not to do that with planetary, but I do <laughs> because I'm too lazy to sit there drawing boxes uh, everywhere. Um, some people advocate, you know, you can draw manually draw a box around a particular feature like the great red spot to improve the uh, the, the stack. I don't generally find there's a, there's a lot of difference. So um, 
the minimum brightness is also an important factor. So um, you can adjust that until you get a good coverage of um, alignment boxes over the planet, but nothing too near the, the limb or the terminator. Hi, Neil. Um, with focusing, I've got a, a question. Um, can you use the moons to focus? Because, you know, the, the surface can be quite washy. Is that sufficient or is it um, the best focus? Yes, uh, you can. Um, I, I generally don't because when I'm looking at um, Jupiter, I'm, I'm looking at the surface features that I, that's really what I want to see. So, or well, the, the cloud features and I can bring those to good focus. When I, when I uh, focus on Saturn, uh, I'm really looking at the Cassini division just to see how absolutely sharp that is. And if it's kind of bobbling around, I know it's out of focus and I move it until it's as still as it can possibly be. Um, so you've got these kind of good measures to tell you when you're in focus. Uh, when I do uh, UV imaging on Jupiter, I often go to the moon um, because I just can't see the detail on the planet. And again, as I mentioned before, go to the moon in and out until it's as small as you can possibly make it. And that's, that can be difficult again, depending on the seeing to ascertain um, and then and then come back. So the, the other thing you can do um, is if uh, you can use a batten off mask or something like that, to, you can go to a star nearby, use the batten off mask, mask to get the focus right for say the red channel. And I've done some studies where using the Badenoff mask to see what the what the offset is from red to green to blue or infrared, um, such that when I then go back to the planet, I can I know my red's right and, and what the offsets are. So you can do some tricks like that, um, but um, I generally don't. <laughs> I found you... that the, the um, and I don't understand quite why this is, but I found that the planets and the moon are at a slightly different focus position than the stars. Like if I use a button off mask and did, get dead perfect on the star and then go over to a planet, the planet's out of focus. I don't understand that because it should be both at infinity. <laughs> well, that's what I would have thought. Okay, I don't know. It could be just... Um... And I've seen some other people, so thought maybe, I don't know, my telescope was weird or something, but some other people have told me that they've kind of observed the same thing. Um, I maybe I'm long enough... Yeah. I wonder if you're having a mirror flop or something. I mean, I'm going to a nearby star. Okay. But, uh, um, but let, me, let me be sure. You, you explained that you use the Batonoff mask to, to find the difference between red, blue, blue green filters, uh, the offsets. Do you focus on a star, on a nearby star, and then use that for your focus on the planet? Uh, I don't. I've, I've heard of people doing that. People say you can do that. You can only do that, by the way, if you have a motorized focuser um, because you you need to establish the position and then come back and, and reproduce right. it on the planet. No, what I do is um, I, I always focus on red because it's the least affected by the scene. Uh, one thing you can do if you're careful is to use gamma and you can uh, drop go to negative gamma which darkens the image and you can see the features and uh, cloud features or surface features more readily. Uh, and then you can do the focus and, and get a, do a better job that way. You just have to be very careful to remember to turn the gamma off when you go back to start imaging. But I start with red, I get that right. I then know what the green and the blue will be. The green will be very close to the red and it's 200 points lower on, on my focus system for, for blue. And when I check that, it's always uh, spot on. Well, the fact that you don't use a star's focus on your actual planetary imaging must indicate that there is a different focus between the stars and the planets. Um, look, I, I, I haven't done detailed enough studies to know that. I just know, um, as I said, it's hard to find the planet. So if you go over to a star... Uh, you're then back in the thing of how, you know getting back to finding the planet. Now, I prefer to find the planet at the beginning of the run, and then I'm I'm confident enough with the work that I've done uh, with focusing to get the focus right without having to flip backwards and forwards, which is a, a bit of a pest. You know, another another trick that we use on a surface on the sun, I'm not sure it applies to planets, is to click the little invert button on fire capture. 
and somehow on bright objects, it's easier to find focus when you invert the image. And that's, not, that's a good one. I've never, uh, never thought of that. But I don't, I, it should apply to any bright object. The other question I have is how often do you have to adjust position? I mean, with 17 meter focal length, no matter how good your tracking is, things must, must move around a little bit. Yeah, I mean, remember that I'm only typically imaging for about 15 or 20 minutes on Jupiter. Um, mm -hmm. With uh, with Saturn, I do, um, during the capture, I will just nudge the focus backwards and forwards to just see if it is moving and whether I can slightly improve it. And no, I'm you... talking about keeping the target right in the center of the frame. Um, keeping Keeping the planet exactly in the field of view. So uh, are you talking about tracking? Um, yes. Yeah, so I use, there's a, there's a feature with, um, with fire capture that uh, it just uh, guides on the planet. So the planet, it's, it's measuring the center of the planet all the time. Um, and it just, uh, when that center moves, it can make adjustments to, uh, in right ascension uh, or declination to bring the planet back. Um, to the center, and that's extremely useful. Um, so you're using fire capture to control your mount? Yeah, yeah. And um, if you were gonna crop in right in around the planet to minimize your file size, it's, it's extremely beneficial to auto guide on the planet because otherwise you have to sit there with the hand controller and if there's any, any discrepancies, it will move out of the field of view and, uh, and create yeah. issues for you. Now, the auto align function is very very useful because because uh, fire capture is looking at that center point of the planet it measures it at every frame it just moves it just in real time it moves it back to the center so any movement is is still so when you're focusing um, it's hugely beneficial to have the planet still when you're when you're doing that work even with an auto focusing Okay. Uh, you've got a lot of compliments over there. You'll enjoy reading through the comment section later, Neil. Uh, is there anything else listening. you want to tell us? Uh, you've got a website or how do we get to look at your, your pictures? Um, I, I'm, I just really um, post on Astrobin is where I put um, my images. I also, um, being part of the planetary community, I, I, um, there's, there's certain... Uh, websites and Facebook pages where I post my images, but for the general consumption, um, my my username is MacNenia M A C N E N I A on Astrobin. If uh, okay. if you want to go and have a look at uh, at my stuff there. Okay, thank but you, thanks, uh, Alex, Molly, Eric, uh, Terry, uh, for the opportunity uh, to talk a bit about what uh, what I do in terms of planetary and lunar imaging. I, I hope everyone enjoyed the. Uh, presentation and, and found some some use in it um, and again uh, I'm always open to uh, different ways of doing things so if you see or heard things you think uh, could be done better uh, do let me know uh, okay. yeah we're gonna end the program but stay with us a little bit and I want to remind everybody that um, it's happy 4th of July next Sunday so we won't be seeing you in person and uh, then we'll be back um, and we'll be talking about Astro Bin in a couple of weeks. So come on back, everybody. Thanks, Molly, for pulling this yeah. off. Can't wait for the rest of your stuff to get from California back to where you are. And uh, I hope everything goes well, well with the rest of the move. And, um, you know, I can't wait for Terry to try that Streamlab stuff. So <laughs> Probably going to crash and burn. <laughs> very, 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 very anyway, nice. thanks, everybody. We're out.